chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We will actually comment on verse 9 in chapter 11 as we begin. If you haven't studied the book of Ecclesiastes lately, you're in for a most interesting chapter. If you have, it won't be new to you probably, but yet it's a great reminder for all of us. Remember those 24 opposites? It's a time to be born and a time to die. It seems as if the preacher, Ecclesiastes, that's a Hebrew word that means preacher, it seems as if the preacher is setting us up for this last chapter from that list of opposites, time to be born and a time to die. And when you come to chapters 11 and 12, there's no break in them. Whoever figures out where the chapter should be in our English Bible just really messed it, missed it here, messed it up. Because there's no break in what he's saying. He's encouraging the youth, the young, and he's moving toward a conclusion to his book and relates to those who are getting older. He makes the comment in Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9, Be happy, young man, while you're young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for one thing, uh, for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. In the scheme of the 11 chapters, that's the sixth time he's encouraged the listeners to enjoy life. God gives us life. He wants us to enjoy it. But this book certainly is encouraging us to take a look at the world around us, see it for what it is, find good in it, but see it for what it is because it's not going to change. The world around us, for the most part, is not going to change. And the preachers tried to give us encouragement in the midst of that, putting God out of the picture to be sure that we're seeing it the way we should as from the human perspective. But certainly with God in the picture, everything has a different focus, a different vision for us. Uh, a different response from us. So uh, he, he's done that six times as he's about to close the book. Uh, verse 10 of chapter 11, So then banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body, for youth and vigor are vanity. So it's going to pass away eventually. Things are coming that will change. Your youth and vigor will dissipate over time. But the reality is it's not going to last forever. And enjoy your youth because of that which is coming, but especially take hold of these things uh, as it relates to your emotions. Remember when you see the word hard, it's saying don't let your emotions get so far ahead of yourself. Grab hold of your emotions so that there will be no anxiety, so there will be no troubles as your body is changing, and by that, aging. And as it's aging, you realize that that too is vanity. You're, you're not going to stay young forever. Um, I hesitate to say this, but I will. Uh, it's those who know us well. Uh, know that sometimes our children don't want to pass certain times of their life. And one of, my, one of my children, I'll not mention which one, just did not want to think about being 30. There was a time in her life that 30 was just old, so old. Well, she's mean. She, uh-oh, I gave it away. Uh-oh. Many years past that. But there are times when we were young, we could not imagine reaching a certain age. Because in our mind, that was really old. And then when you're 31 or 2 or 3 or 39 or 42 or whatever is to come, suddenly that's nothing. You dealt with it, you're okay, and you're ready 
to progress, if you will, with another year of age. Um, but it will come. The youth and the vigor will change over time. And so he says in chapter 12, we looked at the early verses quickly, we're told to remember. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Most commentaries, most of those who study the Hebrew and apply it to this chapter agree on what I'm about to share with you. Every source that I've used over the years, there is no disagreement for the most part with what the writer is about to present to us. Several years ago, 1980 as I remember, so that's several, I was teaching a young adults class in South Florida and they asked if they could study this book and we did and we came to this chapter and one of the young men, it was a young adults class, he said, the things you're saying, and he waited until we got to about verse 6, these things aren't really happening to my grandparents. These aren't happening to my parents. I said, I'm not suggesting that everything listed here is going to happen or their response to aging will be the same. But the Spirit of God guiding, guided Solomon to present something that's real in our world. And it's an admonition for the young to prepare and for the older ones going through it to develop a mindset and a conclusion as a result of these changes that will take place to all of us as we age, not 30s or 40s, but much older than that. And we're going to look and we realize that days of trouble are coming. And we don't find pleasure in that. What in the world is he talking about? Aging, to begin, the aging process. And remember your Creator in your youth, and the implication is so that memory will be there as you get older. And you'll not fall back into anxiety or depression implied when you find no pleasure in them and react in an emotional way that's not healthy for that relationship with God. And so several things beneath that statement. Are you ready to see some of us in the mirror here? And we'll smile about it, and we know it's coming. Maybe some already. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark, and the clouds return after the rain. He's talking about the inability to see well. When the light matters, when some of us reach a time when it's not safe and we aren't allowed by a doctor or our children to drive at night. That's what he's telling us. Those things are coming, and so the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark. You don't see the way you once did, physically. And cataracts and all the other things that begin to affect some of us at earlier ages that fit into that category as well. When the keepers of the house tremble, when your body begins to shake a little bit, not talking about a disease, because that will speak for itself, but when you're not able to control your movements the way you once did. And so the shaker of the house, the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men stoop, uh, you know the commercials that describe the older person living alone and she's wearing something around her neck and it's 
something that's proclaimed often and it's been a number of years. I've fallen and I can't get up. This is talking about someone whose legs are growing weak. Their legs are growing weak. And the stooping is an issue. When we have traveled to visit grandchildren, we'll do that in two weeks. But when they've come here at different times of our life, there was a time of our life when we needed to sleep on some mats and things on the ground, on the floor. And we didn't mind at all. We didn't mind at all. But at one point, not that long ago, our only criterion is, but I need a folding chair close by. You tell me why. When you get down on your knees to get up, there's a certain point where how am I going to get up without something to help me? My left knee just popped. (laughs) Our legs grow weak. Our legs grow weak. And the stooping, the kneeling, is something that has to be deliberate. One of Terry's favorite words. And it needs to be planned ahead of time. So you can be sure and get up. We've been going over to Sister Tommy's to visit off and on the last couple of months. And when we've gone, she said, by the way, do you like pecans? We sure do. Well, I've got some out there. And if you want to get some, feel free to. And we go out there with regularity the last couple of weeks or so to get a few more. And I made the mistake about three weeks ago of getting down to pick some up, and I did not have a chair to help me get up. And I managed. I'm not there yet, but it's beginning. And it's good that we can laugh about it because it's going to happen. And Solomon is telling us, remember your youth, but also realize some things are going to happen with your physical body. When the grinders cease because they are few, when you see the word grinders, what's it talking about? Teeth. Some of us at certain ages don't get to eat some things again. Corn on the cob usually will have to be cut off at some point. The grinders are fewer, as if you've missed them, but the metaphor is also in play when it would suggest, are they just not working as they used to? Not exact, the metaphor, but a similarity. However, the circumstance. Every time I read this, and don't read it very often, But every time I read it, I think about one of the great joys of my grandfather when he was alive, when we would go over and visit, and all of a sudden he would grin real big, and he would go, and his top teeth would pop out of his mouth. And he loved letting his younger grandchildren and those of us who are older see him take his false teeth out and show us his gums and just smile as big as he could smile. We were kind of amazed the first time we saw it. What has he just done? Can I do that? How can you do that? But it's part of some people's existence as they get older. And the reality is, Solomon is telling us it's going to happen in some form with most of us. And those looking through the windows grow dim that's a little bit of what was implied with the moon and stars grow dark the sun and the light grow dark but you don't see looking out the window the same as you once did again the visual when men rise up at the sound of birds but all their songs Go faint. It doesn't happen with me often. I'm a deep sleeper. Always have been. 
But sometimes the faintest sound will stir those who are sleeping. Here, the implication, birds. A bird outside will wake us up. And their songs eventually will grow faint. We won't hear them the way we used to. We've been sitting on the front porch lately, enjoying the good weather, eating supper, lunch, sometimes breakfast on the weekend, and we've enjoyed seeing a multitude of robins the last three weeks. We walked out of the building about three weeks ago, and there were about 40 robins spread out across the graveyard. We've never seen so many robins in our whole life. We had to ask ourselves, are they in transit? Are they headed south, north? Is this a stopping place? And we've seen quite a few since. We thought it was unique to our part of the world, and yet a close friend in Edmond, Oklahoma, mentioned two weeks ago around that same time, where are all these robins coming from? And it was about 10 degrees up there that day. So our theory was shot. It just le left immediately. But... Terry has always been one, I can't even do it. She just whistles to the birds. And I tease her, you, do you have a language that you're sharing? But some people have an affinity to the animals and the sounds they make and try to duplicate them from time to time and hear them in the middle of the night and they wake us up, some of us. But at some point, they won't. We won't hear them the way we used to. When men and women, when it's using the male gender, but it's speaking of both, when men are afraid of heights, I know people in my family that have fallen off of a ladder trying to clean gutters and broken their wrist, their arm, or their back. So it's pretty firm in some families, you get off of that ladder and stay off of that ladder. and Don't even think about climbing on the roof. And as we get older, we're afraid of heights more than we used to be, the preacher's telling us. And you're afraid of dangers in the streets. You're more cautious of being out of what's out there of feeling vulnerable, of just concern, and sometimes it's just smart. And there are some places in every city in America that you don't need to visit late at night. And that's just a truism that's correct anywhere and everywhere. There's some places you just don't go there at night. Others more apparent, maybe not even at day, daytime. It's just not the best part of town. But as we get older, we are concerned with fears because of the dangers that are in the streets, he says. When the almond tree blossoms, tell me what that's talking about. The color of your hair. My almond tree has blossomed. Some at very early 30-ish ages. And they don't like it at all because they look much older than they are. But at some point, we lose the color of our hair. And when I think I understand something, I'm told by closest friends and family, well, her hair's gray too, but she has it colored. Really? I would never have known it. And that speaks volumes to whoever does it. And it speaks to me not noticing those things. But coloring our hair sometimes, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't think I'm saying that. But as the hair color changes, men as well as women sometimes will try to go back to the other colors. But it is a natural process. That's part of life. The other is the grasshopper drags himself alone. What's that describing? No energy. We just don't move as quickly as we used to. 
I don't know about you, but there are some days that my brain isn't quite awake, and this sweet little darling of mine is about six steps ahead of me when we walk. And I say, okay, slow down, slow down. Your, your brain's faster than mine is right now. My feet don't move very well when my head's not thinking crisply. And it ha sometimes happens the other way around. Terry and I'll be walking, and I'll find that I'm walking several steps ahead of her, and I'll notice, and I'll slow down, and we'll kind of fall into a common pace. But as we get older, we don't move as quickly as we used to. And desire no longer is stirred. Um, has anyone ever used the word S-E-X in this building? Sex? I didn't hear anything rumbling. I guess I can make a joke and say that maybe it was said too often a number of years ago when the walls started showing the leadership that they were going to eventually fall and they had to replace the whole building. Is it because they used that word too often during that time of life? Probably not. I'm just making fun. But we don't have the desire sexually as we get older. And it's just part of life. Then man goes to his eternal home or woman and mourners go about the streets. How does that make you feel? That list of aging items leading up to the culmination of our entering into eternity? What's your emotional response? I want some to share that with me. <laughs> so we, we go back to the first one, the mental dullness and depression. I find no pleasure in them. That's what he told us might be the response. But he's encouraging us not to respond that way. He's encouraging us to realize that there's a time to be born and there's a time to enter into eternity. From the moment we are born, we begin to die. And that's not being fatalistic. It's not being uh, putting a damper over anything joyous and all the great occasions of life. It's real. It's the way it is. And it's easier for us to respond to, to realize those things are natural. It's unnatural if they don't occur as we pass through stages of aging. It's not realistic. It's hiding our head in the sand and covering our eyes to the real world. And we don't want to be accused of that, do we? Christians don't want to be accused of that, and that's why they're in this book. There's a lot of things that he described as vanity, but with God, six times we can enjoy life. And part of life is the latter stages of it before we enter eternity, the words he uses. And so there's just a realism there that we need to see and not let be something that's difficult for us. Um, I have done something for the last 10 to 12 years because I was in circumstances just before we went to China that I was around people who had diseases and knew they did not have long to live. Or I was visiting with people who were very much older, one still alive, 104. We're still amazed. But she was just as healthy as she could be when we left, Ohio, left California several years ago and still alive. But she had a joy about her life. But I have begun being very outward in making a comment 
to those. And I tell them, you have an advantage that I do not have. You know you don't have that much longer. And I'm not talking about six months. It may be three, four, five years. But I have an assumption, and most of us do, that I'll still be here. The odds are me still being here. But my comment is, make sure things are right with God. You have an advantage. You're a baptized believer. Make things right with God. You have that advantage. And it is an advantage. But it's something we all can do every day because we don't know the future. But it's an advantage when something like this strikes you right between the eyes and reality hits you that maybe hasn't. I've remembered my Creator. There will be times when I'll say, I take no pleasure in the days of trouble that are coming, but I'm entering eternity, maybe sooner than I would like. Make things right with God. I told my second youngest brother that recently. He's been going through a hardship for 20 plus years with a back injury and in constant pain, and he's going through an up and down series of physical difficulties right now. And he was begging God to let me die. I'm ready to die because of the 20 plus years of intense pain. I said, I understand how you feel, but make things right with God. Make things right with God. Well, he goes on. Remember him. Remember him, verse 6, before the silver cord is severed. What's the silver anniversary? How many years? 50? That's what I remember, too. Maybe it isn't. Somebody's saying maybe not. I don't know for sure. 25, maybe? Or the golden bowl, the golden anniversary, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring, or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. He's talking about cycles of a silver and golden stage anniversary, if you will, of a pitcher that shattered, whether it's, it's not clear here what's being referred to, someone who's getting older and drops a pitcher by mistake, or there's some um, metaphor attached here, it's not understood. The wheel is broken at the well, but there's no question what verse 7 is saying. And dust returns to the ground it came from, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. There's no question what he's talking about in verse 5 and verse 7. And then he repeats a theme that's been here throughout. Vanity, vanity, says the teacher, everything is vanity or meaningless or chasing after the wind depending on which verse, version you're reading. Life can have no meaning unless you live with an understanding of verse 7. We're back under the sun rather than with God in the picture. As he's just told us six times as we close chapter 11, Enjoy life. God gives us life and he wants us to enjoy it. But there's a reality to it. And that's where the preacher needed to close. We comes to a conclusion. Not only was the teacher wise, but also he imparted knowledge to the people. Most uh, scholars don't believe these are words that Solomon wrote. They believe these are words probably written after 
his passing. And it's referring to him in the third person. That's usually how we talk about someone who's no longer writing their own story. He pondered and searched out and set in order many Proverbs, the whole book of Proverbs. Many of those are his. The teacher searched to find just the right words. And what he wrote was upright and true. It was factual. It wasn't pretense. It wasn't some marginal uh, expression that you could hardly relate to. The words were upright, and they were true. The words of the wise are like goads, G-O-A-D-S. What is a goad? Yeah? Uh, it's a wooden stick, if you will, and most of them in this time had a round end. And it was used to poke animals or whatever. It was a poking stick. <laughs> but they were wise like goads. It's a strange word, but why did someone use the goad? The wooden stick with a rounded edge to guide something toward the right way. To maybe forcefully push some animals in a certain direction. It was used for guidance, giving direction. And to his audience, when they saw that word, they knew exactly what those words were designed to do. Now, some of us who are somewhat cynical, and maybe we had a rough growing up, or maybe we were rebellious at certain times of our life, that goad was also used to smack us across the seat or hit us over the head. It was less than simple, if you will, but it was there, whatever the method and however uh, active the method was, it was used to give guidance, direction. And so however our life has been, he wants us to see these words as giving us direction, bringing us into focus as maybe we're leaving youth and moving toward eternity. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails. And that's a very specific word that has no other meaning than what we would call a nail. It's driven in, and it's not coming out easily. Maybe not at all. It's firm. Some of those words are given to give guidance. Some of them are heavily or firmly embedded nails. And then he adds, given by one shepherd. And that's a capital S. And so that's speaking in one sense of God. In another sense, Jesus is called the great shepherd with a capital S as well. And so that certainly goes back to God, deity, God or Christ. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Uh, I have seen something, and you have too, because you have lived these last 20 years just like I have. And though we were out of the country for two and a half years, it's still the same. We knew about it going on there. We have a certain segment of our fellowship, and when I say that, members of Churches of Christ, baptized believers, immersed for remission of sins, they begin the walk, they're faithful, they're doing all that they should, and suddenly, as we've implied a couple of times with our uncommon things we believe, sometimes somebody will come up and they'll add to God's Word. We saw that in Third John, I think it was, maybe Jude also, many months ago now. We add to or take away from God's Word. Adding to is being very, very conservative. And we're saying things are wrong that Scripture doesn't say is wrong. 
we have the choice of doing some things some ways, but to say if others do it, they're going to hell, we need to be careful we're not adding to God's Word and making eternal statements about people's soul when it's not clear in Scripture. But the other side is that when we are removing God's Word, and I use the metaphor we erase, there's lines drawn. Sometimes we draw lines to separate us from others based on opinion, because we can't draw lines if it's about faith, and we erase lines that Scripture would give us. And we want to erase those things as if they don't matter. It's okay. And so he is saying, be warned of anything in addition to them. And, uh, and uh, that concept is whether you're adding or taking away. And um, it's the principle I heard fairly recently. It's the gospel plus. We're teaching a gospel plus as if this has to be with it. The gospel doesn't need a plus. It's God's power into salvation. We don't have to have a plus to it to give it strength or whatever. You don't have to manipulate. That's what usually comes about. We've got to dazzle because we don't think the power of the cross is enough to convict the human heart. We get in the way when we do that, but that's another idea. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. All that Solomon has said about life, without God, going through different phases, putting our passions in the different aspects of living our life, building a great business, but we leave it to a family that don't want it, and they waste the resources that you thought would be of help to them, all those things. Here is the conclusion of all those 12 and a half chapters. Fear God, keep His commandments. Two ideas there. It's not one. Fear is have a reverential fear for God. Remember when we went into the worship, he says, go with your ears open and your mouths closed. Go in ready to hear. Go in ready to be taught, be teachable. Have a reverence for God. Fear Him. It's, it's not all negative, but there's an element there. There's a reverential fear, and it causes you to keep His commandments. God said it, that's it. God said it. Why would we add or take away? As we're approaching eternity, for sure, if we're on the latter stages of our life, why would we not want to do these things? Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. The word duty is not in the original language. It was added by translators. Listen to what it says without that word. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Duty's not there. I think I misstated it. I think I said whole is not there. I have it circled. But I hope I, I, I correct it now. This is the whole of man. That's what you're about. And where does that come from? What has he said as he's beginning to close the book? Remember now your creator, capital C-R-E-A-T-O-R. Every time, capital. Remember your creator. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole of man. Because he's your creator. He gives you life. He's here. Are you here because of him? Eternal power and deity. Romans 1, 19. 
the three things we learn from looking at the creation. He was here first. He had the power to create. He's not a human. All of those are really saying the same thing. The eternal power and deity of God is what the creation teaches us. We're without excuse. Twice we're told that. He expects us to respond to those with giving thanks and praise by seeing the creation and seeing those three attributes that the creation tells us and teaches us. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Some people are amazed when they say, well, I understand God's going to bring the hidden things out in the open. And usually we operate in the darkness physically and metaphorically when we're committing sin or trying to hide it, thinking God doesn't see it. He does. It will be made known. But he also says God is going to bring every good thing so it can be seen. And uh, that's a different, unique statement, if you will. Uh, we do many things not wanting glory, not wanting to be patted on the back. As Christians do those things. Those are things we do as Christians. But they're being observed, and God will acknowledge them in judgment. What does that make you think of in the teachings of Jesus that last few days? Those who go to prison, those who give water, those who see someone in need. He says, you saw those things and did not do anything about it, and you, it was as if you saw me and did not respond to me. And he says to another group, and they, they respond, well, when did we see you that way? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or in prison? When did we see you? And I heard it stated a number of years ago, that seems to be suggesting that I didn't see you, but I was doing those things. I didn't see you in doing those things. Could be the implication. But they will be made known. The hidden things, the good things hidden, as well as the evil things hidden are being unveiled at some point in the future. Yes. Prepare for judgment. Let's just say that in case we get don't get back to it. Roddy? Sure. 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 Rod is asking for those on Facebook uh, because there's a listing of good and bad. Good and evil, is it a scale? You do more, you're okay. You do less, you're not okay. Here's my rendition of it. We will do good and we will do evil. The scale has no bearing. God sees both. And he will handle that in judgment. Yeah. Yeah. We're sinning saints, First John tells us. We can't be perfect. So we will sin even though we've been Christians 40 years or four weeks. But First John 1, 9, we're 
confess those sins. God is faithful and just and will forgive those sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We will have good and evil seen and revealed by God. But he deals with it through the blood of Christ. And some people say, well, good, I'm okay. When I sin, I'm okay. Well, are you? If you don't repent of it and confess it, you're not okay. You've got to admit them and deal with them. But we will have good and evil revealed. As we prepare for judgment, it's real. And 1 John puts several exclamations behind it. But God provides. God provides as sinning saints what we can do with that sin. Four times seven, seven times 70 in a given day. How often do we forgive, Peter asked. Seven times 70. One person in a given day to exaggerate that complete number magnified. We will go to judgment and all of those things will be uncovered that were once hidden. No, I don't think they are. Yeah, yeah, I don't think they're brought up because they're wiped away as far as from the east is from the west. But God has the ability, and he has the book of life, if you will. But let me say it slightly different. The door is going to open. How do you deal with your children? When there's things that have gone on for six months, and they've just been rascals. What do you spend your time thinking the most about as you're trying to encourage them and as you're trying to help them to learn from their mistakes? Are you making a list of the seven things they did bad that six months? Are you accenting the four times where they made a hard choice and pleased God and pleased you in a way that can't be described? You're not going to bring up the evil, but it's there. It's not brought up. We deal with humans that way. We don't. When you go to a funeral, is it proper? And would anybody get up and make a list of all the hard times in someone's life and the times when they're outside of Christ or whatever? At the funeral, that's the time. It, you can't change it. That's the time when you accent the positive things. And you use those to teach and instruct. It's, it's not a strange circumstance as you apply to life. Well, it's the same God. Yeah, yeah. The principles are real. Yeah. No. Their judgment will be, but it's everything they did under the law pointed to Christ on the cross. So it's, it's covered, if you will, in a different way, but it's handled in the same way. But this is an Old Testament book. But uh, these things are written for our learning, Romans 13, 7, I think, so that we'll learn from them. The things of old have meaning today for us. Thank you.